suspect not. Uh, we'll be looking at the legal ramifications of this and how it could be introduced in the UK. Uh, Tom Goodhead uh, is managing partner at PGMBM, who specialise in large scale group litigation. A very good morning to you. Um, I don't know how much of that previous interview you were able to hear, uh, but it is such an interesting debate um, and such an interesting uh, example of how things can change very rapidly uh, around the whole issue of COVID and, and freedoms being taken away. Uh, would we be able to impose laws like that here, do you think? Yes, I mean, it's not inconceivable that we would. Um, I mean, obviously, we have a very different tradition, I think, um, in certain ways towards individual liberty and freedoms and something like compulsory vaccination compared to um, continental European countries or, or non-Western countries. So um, I think it's, as you say yourself, it's highly unlikely that the government here would ever try to impose something like that. But, you know, given the way that uh, laws and r regulations regarding COVID have been promulgated since March 2020. I think it's very hard to to rule anything out. I don't think anybody would have really contemplated a, a lockdown prior to the prior to the pandemic. So I think it's a case of never saying never on something like that. Just correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but isn't that that within the legislation that gives the government the power to do that? They have there is a mechanism where they have to keep renewing it. MPs have to keep voting it back to to keep renewing it. Is that correct? You you do you have to um, you have to renew the coronavirus act that 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 is correct um, but obviously that act gives very broad gives very broad powers and there's also um, acts such as the such as the public health act um, so you know w without sort of going into a, a detailed sort of exposition of how the government could legislate it's it's fair to assume that if there was certainly if there was parliamentary will um, in order to do something like this then it could be effective the, the question then is whether it's lawful. And you know any any sort of mandatory vaccination scheme obviously involves um, interference with bodily integrity. Um, it, it's been recognised by the European Court of Human Rights that um, sort of compulsory vaccination does involve um, an invasion of, uh, of of a right to a private life. But the question with all of these things, rights aren't absolute. It's whether it would be regarded as being proportionate or justified in order to seek to um, achieve a, a an identified goal. Um, and as your previous guest um, said. Uh, so eloquently, you know, the concept of a mandatory vaccination is not a new one. Um, that's something which um, is quite often imposed at birth or for travel to other countries. Now, personally, that's something that I, I would find myself very troubled by. Um, but it's but it but it is something that you know, in 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 very recent living memory, has been has been imposed on in requirements in all sorts of circumstances. Could there be a legal challenge then to that mandate I, to have to get the vaccine in Austria? Could they take it to a European court? They, they could. I mean, they, they would have to seek to um, take it probably, I think, uh, domestically. It would go to um, the Austrian sort of constitutional court first, but then uh, then it could go to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but, but, I, but I have to say, I mean, this is an area where um, sort of European human rights law um, is relatively tolerant and is quite deferential towards sort of government decisions in relation to whether something like this sort of vaccine mandate would be necessary. So I, I have to say, I think I would struggle to see that they would succeed in challenging something like this in the ECHR. Um, the, the, um, the English courts, I think it's a little bit different. And um, this may actually be one of those circumstances where sort of the old, the old sort of common law individual rights um, prove a little bit more relevant, uh, more sort of an avenue for success for people if they were ever to be legally challenging this than, than European human rights law, which is uh, derived from the European Convention on Human Rights. It's so interesting um, you bringing in the e e ECHR yeah. there, because, of course, we're in a unique situation within the continent of Europe, aren't we now? Yeah. Uh, having left the European Union, uh, no longer under the jurisdiction of that court. So would we have that jurisdiction to, to challenge the law if it was changed in this country? Presumably not. Um, Where do we go? Yeah, we... we we, we would actually, because the, the European Court of Human Rights, we're still subject to the jurisdiction of. Um, obviously, the, the CJEU, uh, which is the which is the sort of the final court of the European Union, uh, we're not. But but the ECHR, uh, we are. Um, so we, we would still have that that route or avenue. But I but I think increasingly now the Supreme Court of um, of the United Kingdom is is going to be the final arbiter of these. These types of these types of disputes, but I mean, I think as you um, as you rightly said before uh, before introducing me, I think it's it's highly unlikely um, that we would see the UK government go this go this far. It just doesn't really sit with sort of British traditions of of, of public policy, really.
Yeah, uh, yeah, really good to talk to you, Tom. Really appreciate your time this morning. That is Tom Goodhead from uh, legal firm PGM. BM speaking to us on the Great British Breakfast. Really interesting legal insight there. Really interesting, yeah, uh, on so many levels. Um, let us know your thoughts this morning. Uh, elsewhere in